you both. Um, for anybody who's interested, we've just been having some lovely banter about the United States, Connecticut, uh, Fairfield. It's been great. Lovely to be on your show. Thank you for having me. One of the core missions of our podcast is to help investors become better, more successful long-term investors. And so when we find other people that seem to have that mission in terms of what they've written about, what they've talked about, we like to sit down and learn from those types of individuals. And um, you've done that in many ways. I mean, your, your book, The Education of the Value Investor, um, your podcast where you talk to other highly successful investors. Um, you know, what we wanted to do is just sit down with you for the next 60 minutes or so, maybe longer, and talk about how you've developed your investment mindset over um, a long period of time and what we can learn from that. So I, we're really looking forward to this, this conversation. It's going to be fun, pretty wide ranging. We like, to, we like to think that most of the stuff we talk about is going to be relevant today, tomorrow, five years from now. And I think most of it will be, but there are some things that are going on in the market with the, some undertones that we also want to get your thoughts on. So um, we'll, we'll get into all that, but, but thanks again yeah, for coming it's, on. It's a pleasure. And you know, what an amazing world we live in where you know, I kind of work in public and I say and do stuff. And then I get to connect with you. And you know, I, I, and I, I've, for those who are interested, literally we met 10 minutes ago and I've been having so much fun with Justin and Jack. And uh, I feel that there's a very similar orientation. So, and that reinforces. So it's all one sort of like wonderful togetherness or um, a, a wheel that is spinning, if you like, and reinforcing different bits reinforce. So, so thank you. And by the way, uh, for those listening, we certainly hope that you would go and, and take a look at Guy's book. Um, what's crazy, it's over 2,200 uh, recommendations on Amazon with a four and a half star rating. <laughs> so clearly the book is driving tons of value and thousands of investors to learn from it. So um, that's, that, that's awesome. And just for the listener's interest, um, first of all, there are some really negative reviews as well. And uh, there's, some of them are really painful for me. Like, uh, so, so one of the um, uh, details in the book is that I got a significant helping hand from my dad, which I write about. And one guy in the review, one of those 2,200 reviews, he writes and he says, um, you know, I, there's nothing to learn from this guy. He got a help from his dad. And I kind of write this painful response that you can go and find on Amazon where I say, hey, I didn't have to tell you that I got help. I, how many people wrote books who are helped in one way or another by a family member, and they don't even write about it. I'm at least being honest about it. Of course, he didn't respond to that. But the, the thing that I did in the book, just thank you for shouting it out, uh, is that, um, you know, I, I was painfully honest in a way that when people read it, they kind of were shocked. They're like, do you really want to write this? And I was determined. I don't know. I, I can explain, actually. And so there's a kind of really raw, honest account of... Um, you know, it starts off in, in, in one of the, you know, in a career low, working for a bucket shop, uh, you know, on the borderline of, I certainly was at a firm that was breaking the law. I don't believe that I broke the law, but it was not a place I really wanted to be. Think Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street, not dissimilar. And something about that raw honesty kind of touched the readers. And that's why you get all those reviews. I didn't realize it was up to 2,200, but um, that's great. I wanted to ask you about, that's the first question, actually, this experience you had early in your career working for, um, I believe it was an investment bank, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. And you were, you know, it was during the dot com, during the sort of the boom and, and, and the bust period with these types of securities and stocks. And, and so how did that early experience sort of shape your, your career and where you realized both where you didn't want to go or didn't want to be? And what you did want to do. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, uh, you know, if you're going to make mistakes, if you're going to make big mistakes, uh, I think the earlier you make them, the better, because, because there's more time to recover from them. And this was a huge career mistake for me. And, uh, you know, um, just for what it's worth, if you're younger than 30, look to make as many of your mistakes and don't be too worried, as long as you're not base jumping or something. And in my case... I'd gone to work for a, uh, a, a firm that had a mixed reputation. And what I didn't realize in finance is that if you, if you can possibly avoid it, you don't want to work at a firm with a mixed reputation. And in my case, uh, 
Uh, there was no internet at the time, or little internet, and so there was microfiche files at the Harvard Business School Library where I did research on the firm, and there were some negative news stories about them in, uh, in the New York Times, which I kind of chose to ignore. Um, but, uh, and, and so I went to work for a firm where the guy was doing something that many people do in finance, is that he was sailing close to the wind, he was choosing to look carefully at what the rules were and see if he could go at least to the border of where um, uh, you know, uh, legal behavior becomes illegal behavior and maybe kind of sail around in the gray zone. And, um, you know, uh, well, I, you know, the, the, the law sets a legal minimum below which you're engaging in criminal behavior. The, some people that I, I revere, and probably you revere chairman and vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, set their standard of behavior as way, way above the legal minimum. Uh, but there are people who say, well, all I need to do is to comply with the legal minimum. Um, so I didn't have any understanding of that. I just thought, well, the guys offered me seat of vice president. I got a title of vice president. I thought that was really cool, and I was very excited to go and do that. And But when I was there, there were all sorts of things that just did not sit right for me with me, ways in which I discovered that either the firm or I was putting in the, being put in a position where we were, quote, burning the client in one way or another. And uh, to give just one brief example, working as an investment banker, my job was to bring deals in. I'd make promises to the guys who were coming in looking for money to raise money for their startup firms. And uh, I really did believe that the that the investment bank would back me up in the commitments that I made. And then when it came to the final decision, the uh, clients would discover that they were getting a valuation which was half what they expected, or they were getting a whole bunch of new options issued. And they were getting burned, but it was also burning my relationship with them. I remember one call with a guy whose first name I remember was Randy, and he's like, you burned us, you bastard, something along those lines. And my response was, I really didn't know, and I genuinely didn't know. I think much later, I, was, I had the opportunity to go and have a coffee with uh, Ken Langone. And if you're in New York City, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of buildings named after him. He's the founder of Home Depot. And I kind of said, well, where does, where does kind of like morality come from? I asked him. I don't know why I asked him this question. And his response, as I remember it, was, um, uh, you know, you learn it on your mother's knee something like that, which is like, these, these truths are self-given. So I discovered that I really didn't like what was going on there. Lucky for me, I got out in time. So it took me six, uh, 18 months to get out. I had to find the courage within me to say, Guy, you've made a terrible mistake. You're never going to make progress in this environment, at least not in a good way. Just leave. And at 18 months I did. After I left, I would have been far, I wish that I'd left within two weeks but five years after I left, that firm, large parts of it were shut down by the NASD for securities violations. They were doing things that were, you know, they thought they were on the, on the, on the, on the correct side of legal, and the NASD and courts found that they were on the wrong side of legal. And actually, some people who worked at the firm uh, were, uh, had to do some prison time, I believe. What did I learn? I mean, I think, funnily enough, it was a huge career mistake. So, why? Because by associating with those people, what, you know, once I had that association, somebody meeting me for a new time, considering either hiring me or doing business with me in some way, had to ask what that experience, that work at the investment bank meant. And it could have even meant really logically only two things. Either I was in cahoots with these people, sailing close to the wind, almost breaking the law, in which case I was kind of borderline or probably immoral person. Or I didn't realize what they were doing. Yeah? And then I was just too stupid to understand. Either way, that's not a very good look for somebody who's trying to sell themselves. So I really kind of did huge damage to my reputation. But I was, at the time that I joined the firm, I was 27, which is still rather old, actually. You want to make your mistakes when you're like 18, 19. But I was old enough to recover from it, and it probably took about five, six, maybe 10 years of doing acting correctly in order to recover it. I think that, so it's sort of like long discursive answer, but I think that for um, the listeners of your podcast, 
Something that is really, really important and a huge lesson that I learned is that uh, Wall Street, the financial markets are just jammed full of conflicts of interest. And the people who work there are incredibly slick salespeople. They will seek to convince the clients, the members of the public, the regulators, that they are managing all the conflicts. The fact of the matter is, it's very hard to manage all the conflicts. And uh, what I kind of like in conversations with my father, I remember saying that what, uh, well, I hope that this is not um, too sort of salacious, fruity language for this podcast, but but what what D.H. Blair did with the rusty pipe, um, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs did with a very nicely lubricated object. Either way, you were getting shafted, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just a different way of being shafted. So I learned to see that pattern, and I learned to understand that that was the case. The other thing that it did for me in no uncertain terms is it taught me that there is, and I don't want to call it evil, but there are there are people who are not ethical in the world and there are people that I don't want to be around. And so, you know, I'd never really experienced people like that. And they do exist. And well, the one thing I did know is I didn't want to be around them while I still wanted to be in finance. And the other thing that I knew helped me to leave is that I discovered Warren Buffett and I knew that I wanted to be like him. So I had something to move away from and I had something to move towards. And um, so I think that, the, you know, that taught me an awful lot. Sometimes in I mean, here's what I'd say to anybody who's listening to this who's in mid-career or early career. Mistakes are inevitable. You're going to make mistakes. So A, be only human. Don't try and be perfect. But the second thing is learn from those mistakes because, boy, the worst thing you could do is have the damage of having the mistake and then not out of it. So, you know, uh, you know, in my case, I wrote a book chapter on it, but write reviews, uh, write notes, develop checklists, like go over, rub your nose in your mistakes, as Charlie Munger says, and try to squeeze every bit of value out of your own mistakes. And uh, I certainly think I did that. And, um, you know, thankfully for me, I think my career's recovered, but boy, did I take a hit. <laughs> well, like, like Buffett says, it can take 20 years to build a reputation and 20 seconds to ruin one. So you, yours was kind of the other way, but um, still, you've made a nice... Recovery and I, and I, you know, may have misspoke there earlier because um, you launched your fund in 1997. Yeah. Um. So it wasn't during the dot com boom and bust that you were with this other organization. But I wanted to ask you, um, about the fund and the way that you think about working with investors. And you sort of have talked about how Buffett's original partnership was an inspiration for how you sort of run the fund, um, both in terms of uh, the structure of it and also how clients sort of pay you. So can you just talk a little bit about yeah. how that inspired you? I mean, um, uh, and just to go back to my experience that I think it's okay to say the name D.H. Blair. I mean, all of this stuff is in the public domain. Um, you know, when we raised money for a, for a client company, we, we were taking fees five different ways as, a, as, a, as an integrated firm. We were taking fees off the company. We were, there was an underwriting fee we were also taking options in the company. Uh, then uh, the people who invested in the company, they were paying a brokerage commission and the company made a market in the stock. So sometimes the stock would go public at $5, but the market in the stock would be bid $4, ask $5. And so you were making that bid ask spread of 20%. So you were, you were taking money, you were sort of like taking so much money out of the system, if you like. And then you come to I, I, I look up the uh, accounts of Berkshire Hathaway, and you see that Warren Buffett's taking a flat $100,000 salary, hasn't changed ever. And then I discover that when he ran his uh, investment partnership, he didn't take a management fee. So the only way he could make money was if uh, his clients make money, and he had to deliver more than, I think, a 6% annualized rate of return. But wow, that is the right place to be. And at the time, my father's got some savings, and I start sort of like investigating what's going on, finding that uh, in this case, uh, uh, it was a well-known Swiss bank, that they were kind of doing the same thing. They were, they were finding eight different ways to charge my father's account commissions. You know, every time a stock was traded, but they charged a commission on receiving a dividend payment, and they charged a commission on receiving a bond coupon payment. And I, I kind of started to see the patterns. I saw what had gone on at D.H. Blair. 
and then I saw what was going on at this um, Swiss bank. So, and what I knew is I just had this powerful desire not to do what they were doing, not to not to engage in that kind of egregious behavior. And I, I just remember sitting at my wood paneled office on the second floor of 44 Wall Street, which is where D.H. Blair was headquartered, and um, just like seeing, you know, I had this, I had the Berkshire Hathaway report in my hands. And I was like, sort of, I don't want to be here. I want to be more like that guy, <laughs> you know. And and I didn't even implement those kind of like zero management fee principles as well as I could have. One other point, interesting, but in a certain way, this is about career at this point, at least. Um, you know, uh, we make mistakes, but uh, the world, and this is something that Monish Pabrai, he's a a friend of mine. He's uh, a Buffett follower and lives now in Austin, Texas, originally Indian, immigrated to the United States. He said to me, and I, I, it's, it's kind of a principle that's so powerful, you know, you can, you can do the most horrible things, but if you come clean and you're honest about it and you, you kind of confess your sins and you give an account of yourself, the world forgives you. And so one important thing about the kind of rec- career recovery is that what really got me the career recovery is that I acknowledge that I'd screwed up. And, I, and I, I came as clean as I possibly could about it and told an honest story. And that kind of makes people go strong. And so the recovery is not pretending you didn't do it. It's going head on into your mistakes and saying, let me understand what happened. Here. I think that the, the dis, my disgust at some of the practices that I saw made me not want to engage in those. You mentioned the negative Amazon reviews before. And like one of the things I've <laughs> struggled with in my life is this idea of learning in public. So, you know, I'm a kind of an introverted guy, like starting a podcast, I was definitely nervous. Like, how, how is that going to go? And, you know, you, you've talked about this idea of having the courage to suck and the courage to put stuff out there. And I'm wondering if you could just talk yeah. about that and w- where you get that from. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I just read an article that I'll certainly share with you. It's, it's a cha- book chapter by a woman called Carol Dweck. And it's called uh, the growth mindset, or well, actually, the the this the t- chapter title is called "Beliefs That Make Smart People Dumb." And uh, you know, so so we ha- we many of us, there's so many things in our environment that tell us, um, you know, don't be stupid, don't look stupid, prove that you're smart. And what she says in this article is, if you got a smart person who's trying to prove that they're smart, they're not going to take any risks. Uh, they're not going to put themselves in a situation where they can actually learn. All they're going to do is put themselves into situations where they're constantly tested. And the purpose of the test is not to learn. It's just to prove that they're smart. So, um, and I certainly suffer from that way more than I ought to have. But in my case, um, it, you know, it's, it's a guy called David Perel. I've never met him. I'm kind of envious of him because he's half my age and he's friends with all sorts of people that I'd love to be friends with like uh, Tyler Cowen, and um, uh, he's interviewed all sorts of great people. Uh, But um, he developed this idea of learning in public, and he's written about it, and he's he's certainly done YouTube videos about it. And I'm I'm sitting in lockdown in... um, And he shared something really valuable. He's got a video with a guy called Matt Kobach on uh, how to use Twitter well. And uh, he said, look, we're all being consumed by the algorithm. Uh, you know, our eyeballs are the product, uh, but we can switch that around uh, when we create in public or when we learn in public, because the minute we create content, now we're, the algorithm is being used to connect us with people who are our special form of crazy, which is exactly how we've gotten connected, actually. So that was a, I kind of figured that one out. And I'm sitting in lockdown and uh, very, very difficult time for me and my family because there's plenty of uh, evidence now about what happens to children in lockdown. Children, uh, you're going to, Jack, you're going to find out, you know, age 13, they, you can say what you like to them. They won't even hear it. All they want to do is be with their peers. And, um, you know, I, I said, I'm going to start experimenting with this. And, um, uh, and I, I do believe that I'm an introvert. Uh, or there's a huge part of me that's an introvert. And all of my experience speaking in public and you know, learning to speak in Harvard Business School classes elsewhere, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but um, I, I decided to experiment with it. And I started calling up friends. And actually, I, used a, I started using one of these. I don't know if, you, if, you, if you've ever seen one of oh, these, but I started recording. 
This is a uh, Roland 05 voice recorder. It kind of records high-quality voice. And um, I started putting some of my the conversations on SoundCloud uh, just to see what happens, you know? And I kind of worked on it from there, basically. Um, I, I think that this, this world of learning in public is just exploding because I think it's only growing. I don't know where it's going to go because I think the number of hours... That of of voice recording and video recording that are being uploaded onto YouTube primarily must be growing exponentially. But I mean, I think that you know another thing that comes up for me, and I'm sure I mean I'm sure you have a similar journey that you could tell is, do you really want to be a spectator or do you want to be the man in the arena? And I think was that Theodore Roosevelt? You want to be the man in the arena one way or another. You know, get out there. That's where life happens, and. Um, in a certain way, I can be grateful for lockdown because I think that it gave me the time to think about doing that. And I'm very grateful. I hope that one day I'll meet David Perel because he kind of like somewhere, you know, and I never took the course. I mean, he has he sells online courses, but he kind of said, you know, I, you know, so here's the thing. And I'll, I'll stop being so discursive. And I, you guys, if you want to answer this, you know, when when uh, if, if you remember from the movie, um, Titanic, where Kate Winslet says to his friend Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio, she says, you are so annoying. It's at the very beginning. He's kind of smiling at her. And she kind of, and she says, she, she, she kind of wants him to leave for some reason. And she says, no, wait a second. This is my part of the ship. You leave. And he kind of laughs at her. Well, when somebody annoys us in that way, there's clues. There's something going on. And we need to listen to those clues so we can become very negative and just say, why is that person anno- that person an idiot? They're annoying me. They're, I don't like them. We can say, why are they annoying me, actually? And that's what happened with David Perel. I was like, this guy's half my age. He's doing stuff that I haven't done. And, and then I think there's enormous value to that because you start unpicking it and saying, well, actually, maybe you need to try out your own podcast. If he can do a podcast, why can't you? Maybe you need to try it writing your own essays. And that happened to me, by the way, with the book as well. I'm, I'm traveling in, probably in India with Monish Pabrai, who's a new friend. We've jointly bid on this lunch with, with Warren Buffett. And, uh, and I'm kind of like, this guy's written a book. Yeah? Why the hell have you not written a book, guy? You know? and, and, and so I was like, well, those things came together, and I took action. Yeah, you know, I think for most of us, like, the things we'll regret in life are the things we didn't do rather than the things we did do. I mean, that's certainly true of me. And so I've tried yeah. to I've tried to like live by that. I've tried to put more stuff out there in the world because I'm going to regret not doing things at the end of the day more than I'm going to regret the things the mistakes I made. I, th- I think at least for base jumping, I don't yeah, think any of us should base. regret not base jumping. And I'll tell you something else, which is really empowering about this article is that, um, you know, so I, I so so I gave it to uh, one of my children who her self perception is she's not so smart, you know. And what this article says is forget about proving that you're smart. Just like work progressively, put yourself out there and you'll find out that you'll end up being smarter than everybody anyway. And you know, there, there are examples, Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, they were not great students at school. And there were people who through curiosity and other things work towards, there's a podcast that probably you should go on or, or, or he should come on yours, 1% better. And uh, you know, this idea that if you just get 1% better than your peers, on a regular basis, you take that out 20 years and suddenly you're in a different place. So, um, yeah. Are you, uh, are you familiar with Tim Ferriss's fear setting exercise? <laughs> it's so funny. Wow. This is amazing. So I was at the Ted conference when he gave that talk. Oh, interesting. And, uh, I started taking notes furiously. It was, you know, that, that guy has got, you know, to, to say brilliant is not to justify is not to do ju- justice because it's an unusual mind. It sees things from a different angle. I mean, in a certain sense, what he's saying is so obvious once he says it and makes total sense. At the same time, you know, nobody else thought of it. And the idea here, for anybody who's interested, and I hope you don't mind explaining it, is that what we need to do is not plan out success, because success is easy to handle. We need to map out and plan out our fears and our worst outcomes, because if we can take care of those then, uh, you know, th- then, then we won't be stopped by ta- from taking action. And Tim Ferriss kind of like, I think he categorizes them to three different places maybe. He says, look, some fears are actually not fears at all. They're just irrational. And you just have to take the time to go through them. And then you'll understand that you're actually just afraid of something that's never going to happen. 
Uh, and then, then there are fears that, yeah, they, it could happen, it could be bad, but you can plan for them. You know, you can set, a, if it's a loss of money, you can make sure that you have a nest egg aside so you're not risking too much money. And then, and then so you reduce the amount of kind of fears that are actually justified that you cannot prepare for, and that helps you to kind of make better decisions. And, and it's just awesome, awesome talk. The only th- regret that I have when you bring it up is that I don't think that I've done the fear mapping exercise enough for myself. And, you know, it's very nice to talk about this stuff, but you, you actually got to do the work. What I like about it is, you know, he asks the question, what is the worst that could actually happen? And a lot of times when people ask that question in life, they're saying you should just do the thing you're doing because what's the worst that could happen? But he actually looks at what the worst thing you could happen is. Like you ask yourself, you know, if I'm going to jump off a 200 foot cliff, well, the worst that could happen is I'd be dead. So I probably shouldn't be jumping off the 200 foot cliff. But if I'm going to start a podcast, you know, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, a bunch of people on Twitter could probably start retweeting Jack is horrible at this. This is a terrible podcast. But at the end of the day, no. is that going to really destroy my life? It's probably not. So for, for me, I've found like that that's very helpful. And by the way, you know, what I what I realized is that if, you, if I don't like the content, I can take it down again so I can experiment with it. And um, uh, and so so, yeah, somebody might record and then it's up there forever. But, you know, bar that which I, I guess is a risk. If you don't like it, take it down. And I actually discovered on this uh, video with um, David Perel and Matt Kobach is that they, at the time at least, had extra Twitter accounts that they'd try content out with. So if they weren't sure if they wanted to put it out on their main account, they would try it out. And by the way, just to go to companies, brand managers, you know, companies like Coca-Cola they got all sorts of brands that they're trying stuff out at. They'll try, they'll experiment. They're not going to experiment with, with Coca-Cola, Fanta, Sprite, 7-Up. But they'll have these brands that we've never heard of that they'll try all sorts of things with before they bring it out on the main stage. So it's okay to experiment. Be playful, you know? Guy, do you know um, Toby Carlisle? You know, I, so um, obviously he's a figure who's appeared in podcasts. I've listened to him in podcasts, but I have not taken the time, and I probably should have, to uh, to really focus, he's he's been an amazing educator and he's prodigious in content creation. But he's also, I think, a very very successful and thoughtful investor. So I should spend more time with Toby Carlisle. Yeah, he 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 is a great guy. And, and for us, I was at an ETF conference. I believe it was 2018 or 2017, Jack. Yeah, it was something like that. And Toby and I ended up. We were down there for a few days in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and. I hadn't never met Toby, but he, we were hanging out, we were going to the social events and everything. And he was just getting into the podcasting and he kind of was like our motivator slash push to say, you know what, let's, let's try our hand at this. Let's try to like, look at what he's doing. And actually Toby was our first guest. And I think that's one of the things that we struggled with early on was who would want to like, come on and talk to us, you know, but Toby was nice enough. Um, to do that out of the gate. And then it started to sort of compound and get more guests. And by the way, I mean, we're talking to you. Yeah. There would never, I mean, how would this have been possible yeah. without some type of pod? I mean, I could have probably called you and said, hey, you want to have a conversation with like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know? Um, so I don't know that that's our like origin story with the podcast and kind of like to- Toby for us was like David Perel for you in some yeah, ways. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the there's a few other things that are just, it's not like, um, uh, it's not like by you starting a podcast, you're kind of, quote, stealing Toby's ideas or you're making the world less good for him. There's, a, there's an element to all of this which is um, incredibly accretive to everyone. So the more you do it, the more you become at the center of this incredible ecosystem. And so I've no doubt that Toby really encouraged you to do it. He probably sent you his guests and vice versa. And, and so there's, you know, and that's not true of many parts of the world. I mean, you know, only one person can win a mining contract to mine a particular area. But this stuff is all so, so not zero sum. It's, it's just incredible. It's everybody benefits in a certain way. And something else that I'm curious, it's interesting for me to hear how you've done it. Um, so I used to kind of care a lot or I thought, oh, maybe one day I'll be able to interview this or that famous person. You know, I have a friend who's desperate, who would love to get onto Lex Friedman's podcast who's just like this incredible uh, blockbuster. But what I, something I get a real kick out of is taking friends of mine and giving them a platform when they're, the, you know, nobody's podcasted them before 
and I happen to know that they're great people. I mean, one on my podcast uh, that uh, is this guy, Matt McCloskey, who's actually, he should go on your podcast. He's a total introvert, and he's a JD MBA, uh, works in Toronto, Canada, and uh, just a really, really thoughtful guy. And, and the podcast with him was, is one of my most successful episodes. It's kind of like really cool to do that and not worry so much about whether you become rich and famous or whether you become this big uh, sort of like podcasting personality, but just, just great. So Yeah, you know, one of our favorite things to do is to put people on our podcast who've never been on a podcast before. And like, a, a, to your point, it, it turns out that a lot of those are our most popular episodes. Like our, some of our most popular episodes are someone who never appeared on any podcast before ours. Right. And, and you know, somebody who's just published a book, if they're, if they're half well known, they've got a zillion different offers and it can, can be not easy right. to get them. Something else that's, that's amazing about podcasting, and I would say podcasting and the video version, I kind of put those together, is that unlike um, linear social media where people scroll through something once, uh, this content resurfaces constantly. And that's, I've discovered, is extremely powerful. So I've seen... Um, where I've mentioned something in a podcast and then it becomes relevant one year later. And then on this, uh, um, on this idea of not being afraid to make mistakes, um, you know, one of the things in, in our business is a lot of people are really concerned about things like career risk or, or tracking error. You know, you see so many people managing their portfolios to benchmarks and like, you know, in looking at your portfolio, I was just reading your annual report before we came on, you clearly don't do that at all. And, and I'm just wondering yeah. like where that comes from, the, this ability to be different and to not worry about these things that other investors are worrying about. So, so here's something that I, I think is really important to share with as many people as possible. I don't think that much of that comes from something, some kind of innate something inside the personality. It's more that um, I, I would say we have, in my case, I have an idea or I had an idea of what is the right way to invest. And then I started working on my environment to make it more possible for me to invest that way. And so I, I would say that in, in my case, one of the key things that allows me to do that, so I can say that rationally, uh, you know, I have come to certain conclusions which I think are supported by the evidence of how I'm going to deliver uh, the, the best, well, I, I was going to say the best possible results, but um, the, the, the best possible results with the constraint that we don't have a, we don't, we don't know which path on life we're on. We can have, in, our life can take infinite paths. I want to take a path that gives me good upside, but has limited probability of, of downside. Um, so, um, and just to reconnect that to where I was going, I completely lost my train of thought. Jack, remind me of the question. Oh, so the, the question <laughs> is, how do you avoid you know, getting in the, the game of worrying about things like tracking error? Uh, with your portfolio. Yeah, right. much about trying to be, I think, a genius in the moment. It's about creating the environment that allows you to make those good decisions. And in my book, I talk a lot about moving to Zurich and setting my office up in a certain way and all that jazz. I think that's all highly relevant, but I think that far more critical to setting up that environment are, you know, whose money are you managing? Uh, uh, what call is there on that money? Could they pull it away from you today? Could they pull it away from you in a month's time, in a year's time, five years time? Uh, what is your nest egg? So, so, so it's, it's, you know, in many cases, we all read about something uh, where some, we see XYZ company firm individual has taken, you know, an XYZ position in XYZ investment. And it's newsworthy, but we don't have context. It's very different if somebody who's got a mortgage on their home still hasn't paid their children's college education, uh, God knows what else might be going on, uh, goes and takes on a huge amount of debt to buy 50% of some company that might go bust the next year. Uh, it, it, that, that would be very different, say, to somebody who uh, is worth a billion dollars and takes a $50 million position in, in, in some company and has no debt, has bought all the homes they want to buy, have got all the healthcare insurance they want to buy, all of those things. So we don't have context. The, the way uh, we, I develop, just to try and actually answer your question rather than be discursive all over the place, Jack, is um, so uh, uh, I have to uh, set up an environment where I can consistently do the things that I think are intelligent. But the way I do that is by developing the right relationship with my investors, um, not taking on leverage, paying off my mortgage, 
um, not not in not taking too much risk with too much of my portfolio. And to your point, I, th I would think aligning yourself with your investors, like getting the right investors is probably a huge part of this. You know, if you, if you bring on the people that are going to worry about three years of underperformance, you can't do what you do. So a lot of it is probably pre-qualifying those people before they come in, right? I, I would think in, in terms of making sure they match with your investment philosophy. Yeah. And what I would tell you there is it goes even one step further, which because my experience is that everybody is a long-term investor until the prevent and they're not, you know, and you kind of say, well, you said these things to me three years ago, like what happened? They're like, yeah, well, I didn't expect the pandemic. I didn't expect the war with Ukraine. I didn't expect them to raise interest rates and I'm scared and I just want out. <laughs> and the way, so the way to do it is not so much by asking questions because people think they know what they want and they think they know their orientation, but they don't. Uh, it's through actually the structure of what you do. So, um, for example, you know, we recently brought on in the fund that I manage a five-year share class. The five-year share class doesn't charge management fees. I should be careful. Yeah, I, I, I should be careful because I may be violating securities rules. But so forget about my fund because uh, I'm not allowed to make an offer in public. But um, uh, you, you, rather than ask the investor questions that they can walk away f from, uh, bake it into investment if you like, and the, you know. Um, private equity funds do that. In private equity funds, you committed often, I think, for five at least years, often 10 years, you know? And then the ultimate, I would tell you, that I still aspire to is um, where you never have to send the money back because it belongs to you or the investment vehicle, which is what Berkshire Hathaway has. You know, they, they, if, if investors get scared, they can sell the shares, but they can't ask for a redemption of their funds from Berkshire Hathaway. One of the things I like to ask when we talk to great value investors is this idea of what is value investing. So we, we mentioned before we started recording, we're factor investors. So we tend to buy statistically cheap companies. Um, but you have so many different ways people define value. You've got the Ben Graham people who are trying to buy stuff that's really cheap. You've got the Buffett people, you know, quality and value together. And then you have even had like in, in some of these more boom periods, you have people who are defining growth companies and saying, you know, let's look at the discounted present value of what they're doing. And you can take these really expensive companies and call them a value. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you think, like, how do you define value investing? Unit, unit economics. Yeah, it's really fascinating. You've set it up really, really well. And um, I think that the world's gone through, as I understand it, in the 70s, there is a, uh, a fund manager whose name will escape me, but he was one of, he was called sort of like Nifty 50, go-go years. He was a guy who very publicly just said, uh, I invest in momentum. I look for companies who've got earning growth. And if you've got earnings growth, it doesn't matter what the price of the company is because it's going to go up. Uh, and um, you had people, I believe, I need to double check this, who just said straight, we look at the charts. We, we, we study charts. And, I, and, and what I think has happened is that, um, you know, there's, at that time, there were no courses on value investing. Now there's celebrated courses like the one at Columbia University and Many other universities, Ivy School in Toronto has a course. So, so there are many places which teach valuation. You have this guy, Damo Daran at um, Stern uh, College at NYU who teaches valuation. I think that everybody came to the understanding that this idea that valuing the business uh, is the important thing to do and that you want to try and buy something at a discount to what you think the intrinsic value is. And, and so in a certain way... I mean, that is rational, whereas I believe that, say, charts uh, are not rational. So I think that everybody became a value investor. And I think that the term value investing and intelligent investing became synonymous. And uh, there were debates around, there was a question at one of the Berkshire Hathaway meetings that Charlie Munger answered, where he said, well, look, all intelligent investing is value investing. I haven't really answered your question. I've just helped set the stage. In a sense, you know, um, at some point in the development of world politics, everybody understood that being a democracy was a good thing. But then, you know, the definition of democracy expanded. So you had East Germany, an unfree country, part of the Soviet bloc that called itself the German Democratic Republic. And by their definition, they were democratic, which I don't think that most of us who actually lived in free democratic countries. So that's what happened to the word uh, value investing. I think that, um, you know, and, and look, we're all, it's a free world. We can use language how we want to use it. And nobody can stop somebody from calling themselves a value investor. And because 
when you call yourself a value investor, that kind of gave you credibility. Everybody, I guess, was doing it. I think that for my, um, well, you know, I have a um, a piece of research written by uh, a guy whose last name is Mobusian. I, I'm blanking on his first name. Michael Mobusian. There you go. You said it better than I did. Uh, he's part of the Santa Fe Institute. And he was basically talking about how do you value a customer and this idea of the life cycle, um, the full life cycle value of a customer, another way of looking at it as a unit economics. I think that that's where I part company with people who claim that that is value. Because at some point, I think that it's a malleable thing. Uh, so we know that if you took Silicon Valley Bank a few weeks ago, and, and you, you liquidated it that day. Everything has to go to cash. It wasn't worth anything. It was, in fact, insolvent on that day. But if you were just given it another 18 months, it was totally solvent. So your, your time perspective really matters. And I think that the people kind of taking, they, they, they're doing a projection into the far distant future. They're making a lot of assumptions about that far distant future. And then they're bringing all that into the present day. And then there's the opposite, the person who's like Ben Graham holding a Geiger counter and he just says liquidate today. You know, and so so somewhere somewhere in that um universe or in that kind of like range, you stop being a value investor in my in my book. And you know, I remember at my Value X conference that I hold in Switzerland, people would talk about infinite TAM. You know, and I remember being on a conference call with a guy who was one of these explainers of new economy companies and uh, new cloud computing companies. And I asked him, well, do you look at valuation? And his answer was, no, I don't look at value. Because I think that what what Kathy Wood said. So at some point in that range, I think you say, no, that's no longer, quote, value investing. But, you know, how long is a piece of string? Where do you stop that? There were people, when Warren Buffett realized that holding a Geiger counter over net nets and move to valuing the intangible assets, valuing the growth in a business, many people said that's not true value investing. You know, that's like something else. Uh, and, um, you know, and I think that most people today would say, yes, that is value investing. In, th- in fact, I think people today would say that anything that Warren Buffett does is certainly value investing. <laughs> but, um, but at some point, you've got a part company, but then very smart people say, no, you're just stupid. You don't understand. Mobusian's uh, analysis of lifetime value of a customer is perfectly valid, and the assumptions we're making about this business are perfectly valid. So, you know, that is a matter for debate. In the same way that the politicians of Eastern Germany said, we're more democratic than new countries, you think that by giving people the vote, that's democracy. No, we think by making sure that the, uh, the, the, the productivity of the country, when shared equally, that's what makes a democracy. Well, no, you're, t- you're touching. On an issue that's very, you know, I've struggled with too, because, you know, I look at some of these companies, you know, the, the Carvanas of the world, and, you know, clearly it's, it's very hard to call them a value play. But then, you know, I, I look at the Googles and the Facebooks of the world and I say, like, as a value investor, I miss those. So, like, what did I miss, like, about those businesses? And, you know, so there's a balance, I think, between there's, there were some really great businesses that probably were a value. Yeah. And then there's some of these other things that just have expectations that are just so far beyond reality. I think that Carvana is a really, really interesting case. And, and I can't claim to understand it. Look, I, you know, you, you've obviously read my letter because yeah. I think I wrote about it a little bit. But I, um, you know, I sat in presentations on Carvana and I just felt so stupid because I was like, this is like, you know, these guys are so smart. They're making so much money and I just can't find a way to justify investing in this. And it's only after the share price dropped dramatically that I really had a solid look at cash from operations. And what you see in cash from operations is b- ballooning losses. So the losses just expand every year, and that money is coming straight in from the stock market. And I think that, you know, and, and as you've read in my letter, I kind of wanted to say, well, what were you thinking in a certain way? And in a way, to me, why was this not obvious? Why didn't you raise your hand and say, hey, this is just does not look good? So there was something, but, but I think that, and you, you guys are close to it. Uh, there was a phenomenon in New York City where there was serious fear of missing out and you know something that powerful fear of missing out short circuits even in my brain not living in the new york city area 
short circuits out uh, the part that says, wait a second, look at cash from operations. Are these guys in any way profitable? What is the possibility that they're not profitable at all? And um, that's, that's an unusual case. You mentioned another company that I you mentioned. I think Google and Facebook are the other two on the other side of the coin. Yeah, so, so in, and in their case, I mean, here's, here's something that I still struggle with is that, um, you know, in Facebook, I think this is just according to news reports, uh, dumping $15 billion a year into the metaverse. You know, those are, those are massive, massive investments that reduce current profitability. If you make the adjustment for that, you know, what would you, what would you pay for the company if all they did was harvest their existing businesses and um, pay, down, pay down, I don't think they have any debt, and, and just reduce the share count? But for now, you know, and who knows, maybe how do you distinguish between a company that, you know, if we go to Amazon 2002, three, where somehow Jeff Bezos, maybe he knew, maybe he didn't, that his investments that he was making in the business, I return. And so he was taking every penny of operating profit that he could and dumping it into investments and, and reducing the apparent profitability of the business. And other companies like, you know, I think that if you ask me to bet on it, I don't think that any of Google's moonshots will work out. You know, and, and I think that they're coming under pressure now. I read TCI, Children's Investment Fund, have written a letter to Google saying, stop spending money on all these moonshot projects. Why don't you just run your business more like a normal business? And so even in those cases, we need to make adjustments. But I think, you know, you're right to say, I agree with you, I missed them too. And uh, I also missed Apple. And I think I talked about, I mean, Apple is to me. I mean, it's just, it's shocking and painful. But um uh, and the point there is that uh, you could define those in very conservative terms as value investments. I mean, Apple in the in the you know two thousands, two thousand five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, I think it was trading at single digit multiples of earnings or low double digit multiples of earnings. You know, so what was so hard about that? And I had this idiotic thing that just said I don't do tech. You know, I I and in my case, the ideas of Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Berkshire Hathaway was so powerful, had saved me from D.H. Blair. And they were kind of like, we don't do tech. And I, <laughs> excuse me, was not thinking um, flexibly enough about, um, you know, uh, Charlie Munger says you need to destroy your best I loved ideas, loved ideas every year. Well, I, I eventually destroyed those ideas, but I destroyed them too late. <laughs> I want to pick up on this idea of discarding your best loved ideas, because this is something I struggle with a lot is, you know, you want to have conviction in your investment approach, but you also want to be willing to change it when the facts dictate you should change it. And, you know, talking, you, know, you were talking about the idea of tech stocks and avoiding them at all costs. Like that's the type of thing I've struggled with in my career as well, is I'll, I'll get too like stuck in this one approach to investing and I won't be able to migrate it. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you think about that? How do you think about like having conviction in what you believe in, but also being willing to, to look in the mirror and say, I need to change this at certain times? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, everybody says having a well-defined circle of competence. And how do you decide that something in your circle of competence or not, you know? And, and you, you buy something, I buy something, I think is totally in my circle of competence, and then it goes down by an endless amount. And I say, well, is it actually in my circle of competence, you know? I think that, that it's, it's really, really hard. And we live in an uncertain world. We have far less than full information. We're getting samples of the data that's out there. And somehow we have to make we have to both make decisions on the portfolio that we manage, and we have to update the models of our the world in which we live. And um, I, I don't have any easy or good answers to that. I think that um, keeping a diary, so writing stuff down so that we can remember who we were then, is helpful. Uh, I think that you know I'm going to try and um, share something with you now that. When I try and share it with uh, my CFO, he, he, he kind of like, he, 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 he rolls his eyes. And, but it's, it's a really powerful idea. And if you know, um, uh, I, what's his first name? Michael I'm, Mobison. Michael. Michael, forgive me. You're a huge figure in my life. I shouldn't know your first name. Uh, but uh, it's, so, so there's a guy called Ole Peters, who's also part of the Santa Fe Institute. And... Uh, He's written about an idea called ergodicity, and I'm going to try and explain how it applies to investing. And um, so, uh, you know, um, if I could divide myself up into, any one of us could divide ourselves up into, you know, um, 
a thousand different versions of myself. And now we could kind of like follow through what happens to my portfolio in each one of those. And I get the aggregate of all of those thousand different versions of myself 20 years on. Uh, I, I, I can expect some kind of an outcome based on what kind of risks and decisions I make. But I cannot do that. I cannot divide myself into uh, 1,000 different versions of myself. I have to take uh, one path through the future, and I can only pick one of those paths. And out of a certain kind of behavior, you know, you can have um, a very broad, a broad distribution of outcomes for those 1,000 different versions of yourself, where if you, if you average them out at the end, you'll do fine. But, you know, imagine that we're talking about Russian roulette, or no, let, let's take let's take a, a, another example. Uh, let's just say that I'm I'm a guy who's playing the odds on a roulette table, but in this roulette disc, the odds are slightly in my favor, but only slightly in my favor. You know that might be a game that in um, you know fifty five percent of the outcomes I win huge, but in twenty percent of the outcomes I go bankrupt, and that's you know so on the average I'll do great. But I have 20% of the, of the outcomes where I actually lose everything. And that's just not an acceptable outcome. That is not, so, we, so what is my point? Um, we have to look at our lives. Uh, we have to be careful to realize that we are not the average of all the possible outcomes of the expected value. Because, because there, are, there, are, there are outcomes of how we behave with our portfolio that could take us to zero. And then there's no recovery, and then and then and then we don't get the benefit of all those positive outcomes. I don't know if I'm making any sense. What's my point? Um, when we're deciding what's our circle of competence, when we're deciding our investments, I think that to be aware of the idea that there's no recovery, for example, from a complete loss. If you have a very diff- significant loss, uh, the ability to climb back from that is increasingly difficult. So you may not take the path that has the highest expected outcome. Because if you get that improbable but possible, ne- very negative out- outcome that's unrecoverable, you don't want to live that path. So you need to cut that path out by having a different strategy, if you like. So in terms of circle of competence, you kind of like, and just to try and a- actually answer your question rather than just ramble, um, it's trying to figure out how do I decide my circle of competence in such a way that I rule out those versions of the world or those versions of me that will hit rock bottom. So that clearly goes to concentration. So uh, these people who want to run a seven or 10 stock portfolio, I mean, that's great. But you know, losing 10% of your portfolio in one company is, can be devastating. It's happened to me once. You don't want to do that too often in your life. So one simple decision is I'm going to run a portfolio of 20 stocks. And yes, that's going to limit my upside. Warren Buffett said, if you run 20 stocks, you know, you can't know as much as the 18th best idea in your portfolio as you can know about your first best idea in the portfolio. And my answer to Warren and anybody who tells me otherwise is, yeah, but I'm buying insurance against the possibility that I'm stupid. And I'm also, I'm buying insurance against the possibility that I don't know actually what my circle of competence is, or I have a misunderstanding of it. And I'm also buying insurance against the possibility that I'm so freaking arrogant and narcissistic that I think I'm a genius, but actually I'm not. And so why not just do 20 stocks? What's the end of the day compared to the guy who did 10 stocks? Yeah, maybe I'll end up less rich, but is that a terrible outcome? It's far better. I'd far far rather have an outcome that is where I get pretty rich than to have an outcome where I could get fabulously rich, but I could get to zero. And Jack and Justin, here's something really, really important. And this is like enormous lessons learned from Nassim Taleb's uh, Fooled by Randomness. The more we get success, the more, the more we survive, the more we survive and thrive, the more we're going to be surrounded by people who are simply lottery winners. So they're people who took the risky path and won. And, you know, I, I was sitting at lunch with a former politics professor of mine, and I was trying to understand what appeared to me to be highly risky and irrational behavior of British politicians. 
And, and what he said to me, he said, Guy, you don't understand. Every single one of those people is a chancer. Every single one of those people took enormous risks. If they hadn't taken enormous risks, they wouldn't have gotten to where they are. So, you know, that, that collection of people who are members of the British Parliament are all extreme risk takers in their professional lives. And so don't be surprised when they flame out, as a few of them are, because that's what they do. They take risks. So we should not learn from other people's behavior um, uh, that we see when they're successful uh, that, that that's the correct behavior, because, because they just happen to be lottery ticket winners. And if we go and get the lottery, most likely. Yeah, to, to your point, that's something I've struggled with, and I think investors struggle with the most, too, is, is this idea of when your neighbor is, is making a killing, it, sticking with your conviction and sticking with your approach. So going back to like the idea of Carvana, I mean, people were making 20 and 30 times their money in that, you know, during the bubble period. And, you know, seeing your neighbor do that and be able to have being able to have conviction in your approach is, is really, really hard for even us as professionals. But it's, it's hard for clients as well to see to see those things going on and not participate in them. Yes. And so here's, I think that what I'm going to say is, is wisdom. I hope it is, is that, you know, um, so first of all, be, you know, I, I think that to simply um, uh, acknowledge that part of us. So to be able to wake up in the morning and say, my God, I have massive FOMO here, massive, massive FOMO. I think that that is step one. Don't deny the FOMO. Then the next thing, I mean, there are kind of, you know, Look, as you know from my letter, I went and bought Twitter. I took a great big breath and I bought Twitter at, um, uh, if I remember, at 10 times revenues. 10 times revenues and probably about 30 times uh, cash from operations and maybe 40 or 50 times actual net income. This is pre, this is well, but this is like 2019. In part, I did that. Because I said to myself, I need to understand what's going on. Maybe they're kind of a FOMO, if you like, where I said, I need to get inside this. The wonderful thing about being a portfolio investor is that you don't have to do all or nothing. And, and so, I mean, look, uh, what happened to me with crypto is that I, uh, a, a friend of mine, we met for lunch and we agreed to go Dutch half-half and he forgot to send the money and or he forgot to, to, to stick down his side of it. I, I didn't mind at all, but he remembered and he sent me his side of the lunch in Bitcoin. And so he sends me a WhatsApp message and now I've got a, you know, and so I played with Bitcoin. And then, you know, there were presentations at the ValueX conference on Bitcoin and on other crypto. And we had, we, we developed a, a crypto X uh, chat just for the people who wanted to talk crypto. And we had a, a couple of conference calls, Zoom call seminars on the subject where I started learning about sushi swap and I started learning about um, staking and I started learning about all these things. And I spent a good two or three days diving into it. I opened up a MetaMask account. Uh, I certainly have an account with Coinbase. I had my Bitcoin account and I started trying to see what was going on. So we don't have to go all in or nothing. And I, in that case, literally my total investment in that whole world was $80, you know? And, uh, and I, and at one point at a conference, which was really interesting, I was sending, um, I was offering people, Hey, you, you don't know what crypto is. I'll send you $5 worth of crypto, you know, and I was sending them in WhatsApp and they were having fun. So I was learning about that ecosystem. My point to you, to, to anybody, it's okay to, to do a little bit, to say, okay, let me try and understand all or nothing. Before I hand it back to Justin, I said one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, you mentioned earlier your lunch with Buffett, you know, when you and Munish Pabrai, I believe it was $650,000 you paid to have lunch with Buffett. And I'm just wondering if you could tell that story because it's, it's a really cool story. You know, um, so the, the moment that comes up to me as you're, as you're saying this is, I mean, I've said so many times the power of thank you notes. So I've met Munish Pabrai and... Um, and now he wants to meet me again. And I did something that, you know, every now and then I look back and say, wow, that was a smart thing you did. So I said to him, I meet this guy. He's really interesting. I've learned so much from him already. I want to make the most of it. So we were meeting at um, uh, Whitney Tilson and John Schwartz Value Investor Conference at the Mandarin Oriental in that uh, one Columbus circle, that, that mall that was a new shopping center, which was a wonderful conference center. And uh, so Mandarin Oriental had beautiful views over Central Park. So I went the day before 
to uh, check the spot. And I went and spoke to the maitre d'. I said, I'm going to be meeting somebody. He's important to me. You know, we'll arrive at such and such a time. Can you show me the table we'll sit at? Please make it perfect. Here, I'll prepay. And uh, he really enjoyed it. We had a lovely, you know, uh, I, I used to do a lot of Anthony Robbins. And Anthony Robbins said, look, you can't get away from problems in life, but it's nice to show up to your problems in a nice limousine rather than on a skanky bicycle, mm. let's say. And so I said to myself, I don't know where this goes, but I want to make this a memorable occasion. So we're sitting there, and he brings up the Buffett lunch. And it's interesting for me, if I'd not picked that location for breakfast, would he have brought up the opportunity to bid on the Buffett lunch? I don't know. Uh, but uh, And my reaction is... What a dumb idea. Why would anybody pay so much for lunch? And he says to me, uh, you know, uh, let me tell you why it's not a dumb idea. He said, many people give that money, that amount of money for charity anyway. It's going to a good cause. And, um, uh, and, and they wouldn't get lunch with Warren Buffett. And here you get the opportunity to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And, and just think of all the opportunities to learn from him. What an amazing education, all those things. And... Um, and I went away and I was like, my God, he's right. And, you know, I, I kind of get really excited to meet people who have an unusual and different take on the world. And it's fascinating to me that somebody can take the same set of facts, the same set of things, and they see it com completely differently. And I think that's something that when we see somebody like that, we need to pay attention to them. And we don't even have to sort of say, well, they're, they're so unusual i wish i was so unusual just just be grateful that they're there and notice it be grateful for it and try and learn from it and so um you know i the logic was compelling to me and uh i i offered to take one third of the bid so so mine was was a quarter uh, a third of that and i brought my wife uh and he brought his wife and his then wife and two children and uh he had some other really smart things so he kind of like you know, many people would have said, well, I, I just need to get the maximum business benefit from it. And he, and he's, a, he's, he's in a certain way, in that way, and many other ways, he's a genius. He, he said, no, we're not there to do that. We're just there to say thank you for all that Warren Buffett's taught us. And so I don't know what the other lunch, and there was this kind of generous celebratory atmosphere where he'd already signaled to Warren that uh, we were not going to be asking for anything, and this was really just going to be relaxing and fun. And it was. It was. It, well, I got there sick because I was so nervous. Uh, I'd worried for days beforehand. I was afraid he wouldn't like me. I was afraid he'd be like, yeah, some scumbag who worked for this bucket shop in New York City. I don't want to have anything to do with him. But um, it, it was. It was an amazing time, and I can. I can draw. I can, I can draw so many things that have happened in my life. Uh, they originated, you know, either you could say at that lunch, but actually for me, even more so from Monish Pabrai's invitation to me to be a joint bidder with him. And, and you know, obviously I've learned insane amounts from Warren Buffett, but, um, uh, but I've learned, I could even argue more from Monish Pabrai because he... Um, completely turned around my understanding of how to be successful in a practical business way. Uh, and he's, you know, uh, it, just this unusual mind that sees things from a different angle. And it was, I mean, I traveled in the side conversations, people who showed up for a meeting, people who didn't show up for a meeting, people who behaved one way or another in a meeting. And um, <clears throat> he's, he's a, uh, you know, he's got an extraordinary mind, you know. And so, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And I'm happy to dive into things related to the lunch itself. We might have to uh, hit you up for a connection to Monish so he can come on the podcast. Selfishly, I'm looking at, Yeah, well, I'm looking for an uh, introduction. No, uh, Monish, if, no, if, if you hear this, then uh, you should certainly come on their podcast. But I cannot, oh, uh, I, I can't, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, one of the things he taught me he taught me this. It was really interesting. So I'll tell you a story around the lunch. Um, so he taught me the whole concept of putting somebody under an obligation. So <clears throat> there's a way of communicating something to somebody where you put them under an obligation. They feel obliged. And it's not a very... Some people break out in hives. He certainly does. Many other people do. People don't like to be being put under an obligation. 
uh, because it kind of narrows their freedom to be who they want to be. Uh, you know, what's an example? You know, the person who calls you up and says, you know, hi, Justin, what are you doing on Friday night? And, you know, your your reaction is, I actually don't want to tell you what I'm doing on Friday night because um, you know, so you have to come some evasive way. Whereas, you know, that's potentially putting you in under, on a, under an obligation to say, oh, I was planning on watching TV, let's say. And, um, and then they say, oh, well, I've got something better for you. Why don't you do this? And now you're in an uncomfortable position where you have to sort of like say no if you don't want to do it. They've kind of put their foot in the door. But a person who's really generous and a proper friend, they, they would say, Justin, you're probably busy, but there's, there's something that's come up for me on Friday night. And if you chose to join, it would be great. You know, and I'd love to see you, but no problem if not. They, you know, there's, it's the same idea, but in one, you're leaving the person completely free to decide whether they want to participate or not. And in the other one, that you're kind of putting them in a position where they have to say no. So uh, uh, this happened in all sorts of ways around the, the Buffett lunch in that you can imagine that, I mean, my primary connection to, into Berkshire Hathaway is Warren Buffett's assistant, Debbie Basanic. And, um, you know, people say, oh, why, why do you know, you can't get a room in Omaha? Why don't you call Debbie Basanic? And I'm sure she can get you a room. I mean, they control all the many rooms in, in Omaha during the Berkshire meeting. And you had lunch with Warren Buffett, so I'm sure that she wouldn't mind a call. I'd say, hey, Monish, what do you think of this? And he'd say, well, you know, if you want to do it, go ahead. But I, under no circumstances, would do something like that. I don't want to put her on, under an obligation, you know. And so, and I really learned that pattern such that, and it's a particularly, so for example, if there's somebody who's higher status than me that I'd love to see when I'm in a particular city, the last thing you want to do is say, you know, I'd love to see you. What days are you free? I'm there one day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And they're like, well, actually, I don't have time for you. By contrast, you know, you can say, I'm going to be in the city. If you're bored and there's nothing to do, I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be totally available for you. But do it in a way where it's clear that they don't even have to say no because, because it's, it's fine. It's totally understood. Um, so, you know, that's the same thing inviting Monish onto a podcast like this. It's like you want to leave him free so that, and that it's a much nicer way to be. And then... If and when he does decide to come on, it'll be genuine and it'll be generous and happy. And he taught that to me because people were calling me up before the Buffett launch and they were saying, um, you know, you need to ask Warren Buffett this. You need to ask him this. You need to ask him if he can provide you access to this. You need to, you know, all these different things. And I would come to Monish and say, um, this person has said this to me. What do you think? And Monish would be like, we're not doing that guy. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not going there. We're there to say thank you. We're not there to ask him for anything. Yeah. So, but but just, you know, it's, it may seem obvious to the two of you. For me, this was not obvious. I had a model in my head where success in business was about getting your foot in the door. You know, being slightly more pushy, fighting for airtime. You know, getting your question in, manipulating the person into doing your bidding. You know, and and the idea that actually no, you 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 you're honest with the universe about what you're seeking. But you never put somebody, you never corner somebody. That was, that was something I learned. Being, and that, that one idea is, you know, it's not, it, it doesn't weigh anything, but the expression that comes to mind is it's worth its weight in gold, I guess. It's, it's so powerful, so powerful. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's related to these Adam Grant ideas of give and take. You know, live in a world of generosity. Don't live in a world where... And I, I think that what's really interesting, I think that we're perhaps approximately the same age, similar ages. This is an age where we are right now is kind of when the chickens come host home to roost. The people who in their interactions with others left something on the table, left people wanting more, are starting to come into our own and we're starting to live these happy lives where there are a lot of people who are grateful we're in the world. And there, you know, if I'd have stayed the person that I was when I graduated business school, if I'd not met... Uh, Monish Pabrai, if I, Monish Pabrai specifically, I might have still been more oriented to being a taker, and I'd be getting to a point in my life where most people don't want to have anything to do with me anymore. <laughs> mm. um, that's that that's very powerful stuff. So thank you. I, and I I I think that you know, giving people the opportunity, not pressuring people, you know, giving people the opportunity, the easy way to say no, not feeling obligated. 
I mean, that's the way that you actually can probably get more out of the relationships um, that you want over the long term. So I, I completely agree. Um, how many Berkshire Hathaway, I want to actually, how many Berkshire Hathaway meetings have you attended so I, in total? I started attending, my first meeting was in 1995. And uh, I, I believe that's right. It's, it's the meeting where they uh, split the A and the B shares was the first meeting that I attended, which I believe is a 1995 meeting. Um, since then, in the, in the late 90s, I missed one. And then uh, during COVID, I may have missed one or two. I mean, I was online, but I wasn't. So uh, since the first meeting, which it may have been 1996, the first meeting, uh, I've missed one uh, that I could have attended but didn't. So, you know, how many is that? Coming up for 30 meetings. So I want to read you I want to read you this quote. Actually, Dave, this is, David Perel has come up a lot in this uh, discussion, but Jason Zwag, uh, the Wall Street Journal columnist who writes the Intelligent Investor column, mm -hmm did a podcast with David Perel. And in it, Jason said this. He said, what's remarkable about both Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett is that every year for decades at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, they've taken the task on answering questions on any topic from anybody. And remarkably, they always give the same answers and keep people coming back. And I think it's because of that sort of consistent is rarity in the business community and in public life as well. And people appreciate hearing the same message delivered the same way. So he's sort of saying, you know, they, they just stay consistent about their messaging. And I think you would probably largely agree with that. But where I want to go, I'm interested, what in your mind, has there been anything that has changed with the way that they, um, their views on th certain things, I guess, like if you were to try to pinpoint the one or two things where they've and I mean, maybe you could point to buying Apple or something like that, but I'm kind of talking higher level. Like, you know, have you sensed any change over the last like two decades with how these guys are thinking about the markets and thinking of investing? Or, I mean, I think Jason's mostly right here, but what I really want to get as from your perspective is what has changed, if anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that, that the answer to, my, to, to that question uh, divides into two for me. So I think that their thinking is evolving all the time. And they're updating their models of the world. In fact, our, we ought to all be updating our models of the world. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful piece, uh, you know, of Jewish wisdom, in my case, is where I heard it first, uh, in which it's like, you know, the, 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 the wise rabbis love it when we change our mind, even on important issues. Because when we change our mind, that means we're alive, we're growing, we're thinking. You know, we have a growth mindset. We don't have a fixed mindset. So... I, I, I will come back to that and I can point out, I'm certain, many ways in which their thinking has evolved where things that they've done later are things that they couldn't have imagined doing earlier. Um, but I, I think that uh, uh, what enables them to sit there for as long as they do and take questions the way they do on so many different topics and be feel free is that the um, they have collapsed most of us, one way or another, end up living our lives with one kind of a mask or another. The face we present to the world is not a, an accurate reflection of who we are actually on the inside. And uh, what they are is, uh, again, a lesson that I learned from Monish Pabrai. They are, and I'm going to do it with my hands, they're aligned. So if one side is the inside, one side is the outside, most of us are some version of this. But when you become aligned... Uh, you can be the same person everywhere, and um, that makes it easy for them to be in those meetings. And, uh, and because they're aligned to a genuine version of themselves, they can change their minds, you know. But they also have, and I guess, you know, their values don't change, uh, but, but their thinking on a whole bunch of topics do change. I think that, you know, I'll give you an example of something that I don't think has changed is that by and large, uh, Warren doesn't like uh, businesses where there's a middleman. So there is a theme running through so many of Berkshire's businesses where um, you know it's well known that he doesn't like to work with investment banks in buying companies. He's always dealing directly. And you know, Geico is a business that doesn't work through insurance agents and um, 
uh, Borsheim's uh, does a lot of business by direct mail directly with the customer. They don't even come into the store. They call up the store and, and, and ask for what they want. Uh, and there are other examples of that. But then, uh, you know, I, I don't remember how long away ago it was that uh, Berkshire Hathaway bought Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. They were called different name at the time. They're one of the largest real estate brokerages in the United States. So his thinking evolved on, uh, you know, and there's somewhere he said, you know, I'm actually okay with paying investment banking fees because I know that if I pay investment banking fees, there are deals that I will see that I otherwise would not have seen. So, um, uh, so their thinking does evolve, but there are some kind of core values and principles that don't change. And um, they're completely open about these things. I mean, they, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that they actually had, I don't remember if it was directly or indirectly, an investment in Russia. And it was actually nationalized or something. I don't remember exactly what happened. I just remember sitting in one of the meetings and it was kind of like my take on what Warren Buffett was saying in response to a question was, we understood that those guys were operating by a different set of principles to the ones that we want to operate by and we're not going to be doing anything more in Russia. And this was like, I, it was more than a decade ago. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's an example of thinking evolving. Think of what happened with the airlines. I mean, you know, going into COVID, Berkshire Hathaway owned four different airlines. And, uh, you know, and they they they're about, I believe the stocks had more or less doubled before COVID hit and then the stocks halved. And, uh, and then he sold all the airlines at uh, a minor profit or minor loss. But he, his thinking changed 180 degrees on whether or not he wanted to own airlines. And I don't think he'd ever own an airline again. Um, so, but I think that, you know, for the purposes, I mean, it's always fun to track their thinking and we all learn so much from it. I think that the, the far deeper lesson is this idea of being completely aligned and for those of you who are interested in the conversation that I was having with Justin and Jack before we got onto uh, this podcast, is that when you when somebody's written something for public consumption, that act of writing, and in a certain sense, the act of learning in public is an act of seeking to align your inner self with your external self, and and that you know that that act of aligning doesn't happen. It, it can take many many years to become more and more and completely aligned. And it's far easier to deal with people who are aligned in that way. And it's that alignment that enables somebody to be free and happy talking in public and learning in public, if you like. And actually, funnily enough, you know, we talk about learning in public. Maybe, maybe the original, and I'm having an aha moment right now in case you're interested. Uh, um, you know, maybe the ultimate learning in public is, is Warren Buffett with his letters to investors. I mean, he's so, he discloses so much. And he's actually doing an, an, an exercise of learning in public. You know, he doesn't go and pay a PR firm to write some piece of blurb that we open the annual report and we're like, you know, this is clearly written by a PR firm. It's not the real thoughts of the CEO. But, you know, and somebody else who learns in public is Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon writes a very, you know, if, if you've not read it, his, his letters to investors are amazing. I mean, he's kind of commentary on the American economy. He's an amazing guy. I really don't understand. I mean, a question that, I think I know the answer. Uh, I might. I have a good candidate for an answer. I, I'd love to understand. I know that Warren and Jamie are personal friends, and I think that they see each other more often than many other people in their lives. But I don't understand why Berkshire never bought shares in J.P. Morgan. Actually, but uh, yeah, that's a good question because he definitely has plenty of financial exposure in other banks. But uh, I, so I'll give you my candidate answer which is kind of a fun answer, I, I, it's fun for me at least, is that uh, when you're, um, so, so I, I've spent a lot of time thinking of, about and studying um, uh, American Express. And when you're American Express, so, so for me in the United States, the best airline uh, is what used to be Continental is now United Airlines. I don't know why they, their staff, the way they run the planes, the way they, is just a beautiful experience and I'm so happy when I'm on United Airlines, former Continental. So for me, they're the best brand. They have the best terminals. They have all sorts of things that are great. American Express, for me, is by far and away the leading credit card company. But they don't have uh, a um, promotion deal with United Airlines. They have a promotion deal with Delta Airlines. You can ask yourself why. I'm sure that they've had conversations. Um, 
American Express can do better helping a uh, second best airline improve than it can do with owning with with having a deal with the very very best airline because the very very best airline is going to command a very very high price and it may be that uh, you know and and um uh, Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America, my apologies for saying this. I hope I'm not insulting anybody. Bank of America may be the second best bank in America after JP Morgan. And um, Berkshire Hathaway can make, they can get a cheaper buy in price and they can do better uh, by kind of being the, you know, by, by being, they're not a partner to, they're just a shareholder, but uh, they can do better with Bank of America than they can with. Uh, um, J.P. Morgan. So that's an interesting pattern. So often the best person to do business with for us is not the best person in the industry, but perhaps the second best person in the industry. One of the things that you talked about in the shareholder letter, and also this is what Buffett and Munger have pointed out with their portfolio, is that the vast majority of the returns are driven by a handful of names. And so, and you were talking about, um, you know, not necessarily trimming your winners, um, like some portfolio managers would do, you have to deal with this volatility. But if you could hold on to those great performing stocks, I mean, that's going to be you know the major contributing driver to returns. Yeah, it's a, it's a really powerful idea, and I get the opportunity here to um, debunk and uh, correct a mistake that I've made elsewhere. So, in the past, talking about this idea, I've cited a study that is doesn't exist. And it's a kind of a story that gets repeated. It's a study, supposedly, that was done at Fidelity, in which they looked at dead people's portfolios, and they discovered that dead people's portfolios did better than live people because dead people didn't uh, rebalance and do all of those things. So then, you know, I, I say this somewhere, and this is a great advantage of learning public. Somebody writes to me and says, that is not a true story. I'm like, really? I've heard it so many times. They say, yeah, it's a uh, you know, old wives' tale, something like that. It's scary. So um, Schiller, Robert Schiller is a professor at Harvard University, and he has talked about narrative economics. Uh, and, and what he talks about there is how stories can have a viral aspect to them, and stories that are not even true can have a viral aspect to them. So why am I bringing that up? Because... You know, I just want to debunk that is not a true story. But the basic principle encapsulated in that story, in this case, happens to be true, I believe, or I can be think is provably true, is that um, uh, if you take a random portfolio and hold it for a very long time, uh, you know, take take out of X, X stocks in the S&P, take a random 20 names, allocate 5% of your theoretical portfolio to them, and then hold them for a very long time, you'll get some big winners a lot of things that do nothing, and then you'll get some big losers. And the majority of your returns will result from your big winners. And the question that arises, if that is the case in a passive portfolio that is selected once, every time I intervene in the portfolio, I'm going to be paying transaction costs of one, one form or another. And I need to ask myself, how likely is it that the intervention that I'm going to make is going to outweigh this basic principle that a few winners are going to carry the portfolio forward. And I think that the, the odds are against you. You need, to, you need to see overwhelming odds to make a move. Then you might have overwhelming odds. You might have clear evidence that a company is about to go bankrupt. You should take every single penny off the table. But the, but the standard for behaving needs to be very, very high. It needs to be more than just, uh, I'm rebalancing my portfolio in my humble opinion. Another idea there that is really fascinating, and forgive me if uh, you, know, you and or your listeners, uh, audience, don't know Berkshire Hathaway as well as I do, but Berkshire Hathaway is well known for being this conglomerate that, that has all these different businesses in it. But actually the companies that, that carry the vast majority of the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway, a small proportion of the total numbers of businesses that Berkshire Hathaway has bought. So the same principle applies within Berkshire Hathaway, probably implies between, within many different businesses. So um, it's just, you know, the, the, the principle, if I just pause and self-reflect, you know, that, that principle that I'm enunciating is, is very simple to talk about and demonstrate. Far more difficult is to actually act in such a way that you don't 
uh, um, uh, rebalance the portfolio because it can be painful. You know, you see, you see a stock go up five times and then it goes down by 50%. And, you know, it's like, they shoot, <laughs> that's painful. Actually, how many charts have we looked at of companies from this most recent era that went up 10, 20, 100 times and now they're down 90%. And guess what? They ain't ever going back. So which one of them do I own, you know? Yeah. Well, and by the way, I think if you look at the return history of Berkshire Hathaway, you know, you're going to see, especially in the early days, not now, because the, it's a much more stable company. But, you know, when Buffett was, when Berkshire Hathaway was first public, I think you had major, major volatility uh, in the shares in those early days of Berkshire. Yeah. Um, where now it's more of just, you know, a consistent like compound or big blue chip stock with, with some, you know, outperformance potential um, still, given that how the portfolio is structured, but, um, but just so I tell you what, the probability, I agree, you know, I, I got to intuitively believe that the probability that Berkshire has a huge sort of like mispricing is uh, far lower now, but, but we cannot rule out that one of these days Berkshire Hathaway declines by 50% for no good reason, or is trading at less than 50% of its intrinsic value. It could happen. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the idea that you're expressing, which is, yeah, that, that's not going to happen. You know, it's like, it's funny. It's like, yeah, yeah. And, and then it, you know, and I have a theory that God is watching me, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I, please, if you're atheist, not atheist, you know, just take it with a pinch of salt. It doesn't really matter if you're atheist or not atheist. Somebody is watching you. It's not, it's just a game, it, you know, however you want to describe it. And, um, you know, and, and once he sees that I've taken an action saying, ah, yeah, that's never going to happen. He's in order to test me. You know? <laughs> it's, it's called, it's called the market God, the market gods, the market, <laughs> you know, actually it's a, it's a great place for people who uh, have an elevated, uh, uh, um, impression of themselves. Cause it ha every single person gets their head handed to them by the market sooner or later. We like to end each episode with a standard closing question, which is if based on your experience in the markets, if you could impart or teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? Oh, it's got to be just one. Oh, it can be, it can be 10. We've talked about a lot of them already. Probably. I mean, I, I think that something that is Really, really important, especially in this environment. I think that we have a lot of investors who may have felt like they were overexposed to, you know, growth stocks with no earnings. Uh, they may have invested far too much in crypto. Um, you know, I think a lot of investors right now, maybe they invested long on the yield curve and they're kind of shocked to see interest rates rise and they're looking at losses on their bond, por bond portfolio. And, uh, I think that uh, point number one is be kind to yourself. You're only human. It's okay to be human. Don't think of yourself as a god. Don't compare yourself as a god. Don't compare yourself to lottery winners. That's not the comparison that you want to make. And um, uh, so, so that that kind of healthy sense of self self forgiveness on the one hand, uh, while at the same time having a healthy sense of being willing to continue to take action and being willing to continue to put yourself out there, if you like, on an investing standpoint or in terms of, I mean, it also applies in learning in public. So, you know, take your lumps, be forgiving, don't let them push you into inaction and continue to learn and update your models of the world. And um, it's by the act of forgiving ourselves for mistakes in the past up to continue to be brave. And to find, and if something that we haven't covered actually is that we've talked about kind of quote risk averse approaches to the world, and and the question is how do you um, be risk averse? How do you take care of the downside? How do you make sure that you're not on a path one of those you know slicing yourself into a thousand people, one of the paths that takes you to a big fat zero, um, but at the same time continue to put yourself out there. Continue to find ways to benefit from the upside that the markets and life can offer you without risking everything. And that kind of, and I think part of that is being forgiving to yourself. So I think that uh, uh, to be the man in the arena, whether it's in, in your investing, to be the person taking action, to be taking positive action, to be exposing yourself to the upside, you need to accept and understand that you will make mistakes you need to forgive yourself the mistakes and you need to make sure 
that the mistakes don't wipe you out so you continue to play in the game if you like that's uh i don't know if that's a composite point or one point but i think that's what i kind of want to end with thank you very much guy this has been great really appreciate your time yeah it's such a pleasure to meet the two of you i can't make wait to meet you in person if you decide to come to the berkshire hathaway meeting would love to host you at one of our events and uh if not maybe in new york city because i'm there quite often it's great looking forward to meeting you thank you this is justin again thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns you can follow jack on twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on twitter at, at jj Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.